and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Now over to uh, uh, further in John's Gospel, and we'll read in chapter 5, please, uh, verse number 17, just a short reading here from verse 17. <clears throat> but Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he, ha he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself, making himself equal with God. And over to chapter 13, please, from verse 1. <clears throat> chapter 13. Verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas, Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God, and went to God, he riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. Now, we could read on in that lovely chapter, and of course you could do that at your leisure, but over to chapter 19 <clears throat> and verse number 15. Chapter 19 and verse number 15. Just at the end of verse 14 it says, uh, Behold your king. But they cried out, Away with him. Away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. They delivered he, then delivered he him, therefore, unto them to be crucified. <clears throat> and they took Jesus and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went forth into a place called the place of a skull which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him, on either side one and Jesus in the midst. And lastly, uh, if we can just turn to a verse that's not in the Gospel of John, in Second Peter, <clears throat> and we'll find a verse in chapter 3, And verse 3, 2 Peter, uh, chapter 3 and verse 3, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers slept, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. And we're sure that God will bless his word and he desires that you, you will come to know his son. I've read five things. I wonder if I was clear enough with this tonight to just point out in the reading um, that there are five things that are really his. Now I've asked the question tonight, are you his? Are you sure? Are you secure? Are you sure that you... Are his. Well, there are five things that we want to think about. His glory. We read about that. John says we beheld his glory. His own. 
his own. Oh, tonight, just to label ourselves, just to remind ourselves of what his, just to say, I belong to Christ. I am his, is the hymn writer, and he is mine. His father, we read about that, God was his father. God is his father. He is the eternal son of God. And so we're learning more about the Saviour tonight. He is the centre of this great subject, the, the gospel message. And lastly, we read about, of course, his cross and his coming again. Jesus bearing his cross. And where, they say, where is the promise of his coming? So first of all, let's think then about this. We beheld his glory in John chapter number 1. And verse 14, we beheld his glory. You know, glory is something that is very difficult. It's very elusive, hard for us to define. What do we mean by glory? We might easily, in one sense, think about it as achievements that are notable, that have been won, some fame or renown, some accolade that someone has achieved that is beyond the norm. And they've won for themselves fame, glory, that they've attained something that none else could have attained, maybe multiple times. Of course, the Lord Jesus has won something. He's attained something tonight. He's obtained, he's purchased eternal uh, redemption. He has made possible salvation. And of course, there's an acquired glory to the Lord Jesus. And all that he has done, he's acquired glory for himself. And he has won the day when he died at Calvary. It was no afterthought of God at all. It's the great victory of Calvary. And he's the great victor who's triumphantly returned home to heaven even now. We can think about glory in different ways. Some have described it as his personal glory, of course. And uh, his official glory, many titles of the Lord Jesus as we look through the Bible, that's how he is described to us in, in ways that we can try and grasp and understand the importance of this person that we are asked to believe in. Who is he after all? He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the one that all kings will give homage to in a coming day. He is the son of David and the son of Abraham with every right to, to, to Israel's promises and the one who is the fulfiller of all these things. He's the high priest and the advocate and so many things he is. These are great titles and many, many, many more. Official glory that is really his. It resides in the title, doesn't it? And we've seen so much of that to, uh, recently uh, and titles that have been conferred to the king and come from the queen so recently titles that have been passed on and these are titles of homage and respect aren't they and so glory we think about it there's something about magnificence here something about outstanding beauty of grandeur of majesty that is being conveyed to us here is one and John says we beheld his glory. It wasn't this official glory that he was thinking about, of course. It wasn't the personal glo uh, so much the personal glory of Christ. For all of that, he, when he was here, he veiled his glory. But what they saw there was the moral glory of the Lord Jesus. That could never be veiled. That which they saw was a man living on earth and pleasing God like nobody else could. And over the record of his life, uh, we can look and search as high and low. And we see this, the word of God telling us that in him is no sin. There's no ugly traits of the character flaws that is found in the human race found in Christ. No defects that would be found in us. The vile marks of sin that that, that, that we find within our hearts that God finds so heinous. And so we think of him, the personal 
glory of Christ. Of course, was seen in one sense. It was seen in the radiance. Uh, he could say, well, one day he says this, that they might behold my glory. Ultimately, we'll see that glory in heaven. But it was really this, the moral glory. And so John is saying, we beheld his glory. And so this is the idea of this, is to have an attentive look and to have your whole uh, vision captured with this person of the Lord Jesus, to look admiring, admiringly and to learn by looking. And when John looked at him, he learned something about himself, of course, how sinful he was. But he learned something about Christ, how sinless he was. And it completely captivated his attention. He took a deep look at the Lord Jesus. And that is what we would want you to do tonight. To look upon Christ. Not us with all our faults and our flaws. And we fall so short of him and of his standard. But of this completely different man of a different order altogether the Son of God. You know, in John chapter 12, uh, John writes a commentary on Isaiah's vision of Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says this, uh, uh, or John says this in chapter 12, these things speak Isaiah. He's referring to Isaiah chapter 6, and he says, when he saw his glory and speak of him. So Isaiah 6 comes before his minds tonight. What was seen there? Well, the sovereign was seen. The Lord was high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. This was a year that the king died. Oh, we have, uh, our country is going through a period of national mourning, of course. The year that King Uzziah died. Isaiah saw something different and someone on the throne, not the throne of Israel, but higher than that, he got a vision that God was still on the throne. And the sovereign Lord was there. And angelic, angelic beings flew at his bidding, and they said, holy, holy, holy. You know, I see his vision is this, that God is thrice holy. The whole earth, he says, is full of his glory. One day that will be true. But when Isaiah got that vision, he says, woe is me. I don't know how you feel in the presence of God as you think about it tonight because we believe that Jesus is in the midst of his gathered people. And how do you feel in the presence of God tonight as it registers with you that God is thrice holy? And you and I are but men and women and boys and girls. God is so holy And says Isaiah, woe is me, for I am undone. I am undone. Hasn't God searched your heart before? Uh, And you've said to yourself, I'm found wanting. Uh, 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 It's registered, it's resonated in me that I am sinful. What must I do now? Well, thankfully in that day, There was a coal that was taken off the altar. Oh, salvation in that sense was provided from the altar. And the altar, it touched his lips and thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged, was the word from God. And wouldn't it be good, wouldn't it be a good meeting tonight if you realised that there's an altar, Calvary, and that you're a sinner and that Christ died for sinners, therefore he died for you. And your sins, my friend, tonight, However many, God knows them. And you may be ignorant of them all. I dare say you are. So many we've done and not thought about. But he can cast them behind him. And your sins and your iniquities can be remembered no more. What about it tonight? Are you his? Are you his? Do you belong to Christ? He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. Well, I don't know how I'm going to go on tonight, get through all these points, far too many, I think. But you see the word, he says now, it became flesh. You know, when we express ourselves, we use sentences, don't we, of course. 
and words. But God's saying this to us tonight, it's just the word. That all that God has to say has been conveyed to us in a single word. You see, it's just a, t- it's a title for our Lord Jesus. In the beginning, chapter 1 and verse 1, was the word. And what is it telling us? He ever was there. And he ever was with God. Here's the eternal. Here's the eternal Son of God. And the one who was with God. He's the Word. He's everything that God has to say to man. And everything he wants to convey to all the universe. It's all in Christ. And it's all going to be headed up in Christ. And he says this, the Word. Here's the marvellous thing. The one that was with God, that word, him, himself, who he is, became flesh. Oh, he became a man. He deigned to come down to where we are. And he made himself a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. And he came down into, uh, to be born of a virgin and, and to live as a man amongst men. God's word is not ambiguous, is it? God's message is so clear because it's Christ. God has spoken clearly in his Son in these final days, and that's all that God has to say to us. The word, he says, became flesh. And we're faced tonight with the fact that God, with the miracle of Christ incarnate in flesh, And John says elsewhere, he says, we beheld, we beheld him. That which we have heard, we have seen with our eyes, we've been studying these verses recently, haven't we, together? Which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled of the word of life. You see, John is saying it was all real. I heard him, I saw him, I touched him. He was real, he's a real man. And yet he's the creator of all things. Says verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. You know, they gave him the outside place at the outset, didn't they? And maybe, you know, just let that register again that you, perhaps tonight, if you're giving him the outside, shunning him, giving him the cold shoulder tonight, you're just like the people of his day. Outside. He's on the outside, and you're not his. Oh, to be his tonight. But he dwelt amongst us. You know, that the idea there is just like a, 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 a tabernacle, a short journey. How true his journey was so short, those 33 years or so. And says John, uh, we'll see this quickly as we pass on. He's full of grace and full of truth. You know, if it was just truth tonight, God's truth said we're all sinners. And every soul is mine. Yes, God has creatorial rights over us all. And the soul that sinneth, it will die. And it's judgment. This truth comes against us. The axe laid at the trees. And every one of us must die because of sin. It's all truth, you know. But he's full of grace and truth. How could God coexist in this world where men were? How could Christ rub shoulders with sinful man? He's full of grace. And tonight, I tell you, there's grace for you and grace abounding if you'll come to him. Let me just quickly think about this next point, his own, his glory. Just to see something tonight, oh, to catch a, a glimpse of the wonder of Christ. May that melt your heart tonight. For he is so majestic, and yet he humbled himself and he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We read about his own, John 1 and verse 11. We read about his own in John 13 and verse 1. And by way of contrast tonight, his own, verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 11 He came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own people, his own things, given the outside place, rejected. Then in chapter 13, his own. 
his own. Having loved his own, he loved them to the end. The Lord Jesus preparing his disciples, those that had received him, those that had come to know him, not the Israel that would reject him and hate him without a cause, not them, but his own, his own people. The question tonight really is this. Do we believe in him? But as many as as received him, gave he power to become the children of God, to them that believe in his name. We've said already tonight, that's a big commitment. That's putting your all in. That's being totally involved in it. It's not a mental, just a mental assent and agreeing with some creed or some verse even in the Bible. It is giving your all to Christ and being his. You know, in the upper room there, we read a bit about it, didn't we? Just before the Lord Jesus would be crucified, he's with his disciples, he's about to wash their feet, he's even going to wash Judas' feet. And here's a man who's going to kiss uh, the very Son of God to identify him in the Garden of Gethsemane, that they would lead him away. And it's said about him that he kissed the very door of heaven and never entered in. That he, he sold the Lord Jesus that we've been speaking well about, I hope, tonight. He sold him for 30 pieces of silver. He gave him up for a poultry sum. And of course the Bible tells us the after story of that. He went out and hanged himself afterwards, filled with remorse but not repentance and he went to his own place a place of perdition a place of suffering, of course hell but you know in that upper room he made certain promises, he said to his own his own, I'm going to give you peace that the world can't give, I'll give you the joy that the world won't know I'll, get, I'll show you the love that can never be experienced by the world because you belong to me. You're mine. Are you his? Do you know that peace and joy that is so precious to us? And the Bible says this, of those that he had, he lost none, save Judas. You know, they took 12 disciples, 12 apostles with them. And when the Lord Jesus is speaking about it, he says, I've, only lo- I've not lost any of the- those that-, that God had given me. You know, in a prayer in chapter 17, this is what he's expressing really, that all those that were his were never lost. You know, once you're his, you're his forever. Eternally secure. You know, often I, I find myself reveling this and telling you about it. Because it's so precious. You can never be lost. The Bible talks about being in the hands of Christ and in the hand of God. And that's an iron grip. That's a grip that can never be relinquished, slackened off. Unto my sheep, he says, I give eternal life. They shall never perish. You know, he never lost any then. He's not going to start losing any now. If you're his, you're his forever. His cross. Oh, tonight, to come to the cross. Oh, it's the pinnacle of it all, really. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scriptures. He was buried and rose again, according to the Scriptures. His cross. You know, I marvel at it tonight, to think that they gave him this cross, didn't he? But he made it his. Oh, you know, I don't simply mean that by resignation that he accepted this thing, that he took up upon the cross in some reluctant way, but rather he was willing to take the cross and bear the shame and the burden of it all. We don't simply mean that Christ, when he bore that cross, was an un suspecting victim 
But rather, here's the victor of Calvary. It was always God's plan. And as we said, he became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Not just death, but this kind of a death. He made it his cross. Of all the things you know, that were really his, you know, the cattle in a thousand hills, forests, uh, the beasts in the, in the forest, they're all his, you know, we've only spoke about five things maybe, if we get there tonight, five things, there's so many things that are really his, but of all the things that are his tonight, a cross, Most unexpected, most undeserved. But the Bible says this, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on the tree. You know, all the words of the scripture must be fulfilled. And he must bear the, cro the curse. And he must be the sin bearer at Calvary. And they robe him with a, 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 a robe of mockery. They give him a cruel uh, crown of thorns. And they gamble for his vesture. And they spit upon him. And they mock him. And they treat him with shame and disdain and hatred. A cross. Oh, he knew it all. And the Bible says this, he was numbered with the transgressors. You know, what that really means, this uh, in a certain sense, is he was counted amongst them. Just as if he was one of those who had broken God's laws, but he'd never broken any. In him is no sin. But you know, the Bible says this, he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. That's why he could do it. And that's why he's willing to do it. Because he's sinless, utterly sinless, and yet he bore sin. And he was willing to die. Oh yes, to give up life and, and, and shed precious blood that sinners can be saved. And that blood, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth from all sin. Don't doubt it tonight. Take him to be your own and he'll cleanse you from your sin. So he never broke any of God's laws. No, rather he, 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 he magnified the law. He made it an honourable thing. And, and so here is the Lord Jesus. The hymn writer, he says, Only a, a cross did they give to my Lord, only a borrowed tomb. Today is seeking a place in your heart. Will you still? Will you still say to him, no room? M maybe you know you should give him room. Uh, and maybe tonight, you know who he is, so oh, wondrous person of the Lord Jesus, God's Son. And you acknowledge that. You acknowledge he died at Calvary. And maybe you even say, did he die for me? Oh yes, the Son of God, says Paul, he loved me and I was such a sinner. And he gave himself for me. I want you to take that in tonight and to believe it. Will you give him room tonight? Give him room. Oh, the dignity of the Lord Jesus. Dignity in this adversity. As he takes the steps to Calvary. As he moves to the cross. And no men shame him. And no, he's the song of the drunkard. And no uh, men are, are reviling him. He reviles not again. And by dying, he defeats death there at the cross. He tastes Death for every man. He's experienced the reality of death. And he rose again. His cross. You know, he made it his cross. It says the Bible that he made peace. He made peace, not between men. Although there is peace between men because of it. But between God and man. He made peace through the blood of his cross. Actually, I suppose it's between Jew and Gentile really as well. And between God and man. You see, everyone can come into the blessing, Paul is saying in Ephesians. No matter where our background is, no matter who we are, we can still have peace by faith and by faith alone.
his cross. His Father. You know, we read about that in John 5. In fact, you can read so much more about that in that chapter. It's a, it's a lovely, another lovely chapter in John's Gospel. It's so deep. But you know, what, a, what, what truth is there? The Father. You know, we've been thinking about that too. The Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. How good tonight to know that there is a, a Saviour for, for those that will believe in him. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And the Father sent the Son. Who else could he send? Who else could save? None. Only Christ. And only he was good enough. And so they say about him, That he's just uh, claimed equality with God, you see. My father. My father worketh and I work hitherto. And they recognised exactly what the Saviour was saying. They said, look, if you're saying that, you're saying you're God. And so you're blaspheming. There's no doubt in their minds. Maybe it seems a bit strange to us, but you see, actually this claim of equality with God is absolutely true. The Son and the Father, equal in essence. When we think about God, we can think about the Lord Jesus. He says, I am the way to God. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father except and but by me. And so tonight, we think of Christ's equality and unity with God, his dignity, his authority. He is equal with God. And here is one tonight. And he pleased the Father in everything he did. The Father sent the Son. No one else could accomplish this mission. No one else good enough to die for me and for you at Calvary. No one else could, could uh, glorify God in the earth and finish the work that he gave him to do. None. Heaven and earth could be, uh, be searched through. And is there any worthy? Revelation, I'm thinking about Revelation 5. Is there anyone worthy to open the book and, and unloose the seals? There's none worthy. None worthy. And it says John wept much. And then he saw a lion. He saw a lamb. And there he was now, a lamb freshly slain. The lion of the tribe of Judah. He really appears as a lamb, freshly slain. The victor of Calvary. The son of God. And he stands tonight, willing, outstretched arms, bidding you to come to him. Bidding you to receive him and make him your own. Sorry about that, just dropped some of my notes there. His coming. His coming. And the question in Second Peter was this where is the promise of his coming? You know, this is really a, a defiant statement. This is really man boastfully saying, denying any possibility that Christ is coming again. What they're saying is that everything's just continuing as it always has. Yesterday is the day, same as the day before, same as last week. Turn the clock back and take out the calendar and go back years and years. Everything is the same. And it remains the same. Just as it was when our fathers were around, there's no difference. Effectively, they're saying this, judgment won't fall. Judgment isn't coming. And they're saying, where is the promise of his coming? Oh, God promised that he would come in judgment, but it doesn't look likely. In fact, it doesn't even seem probable. In fact, we'll dismiss the whole thing and they're lulled into a, sen a false sense of security. And in the mind of man, 
everything's continuing undisturbed, as we said, they'll not face God. They'll not face God. Well, tonight, again, I know at the end of the meeting, we'll come to the facts again. Look at them full square and says God that he appointed a day in which he will judge the world. And he's appointed to judge Christ. And Christ is the judge, the saviour. The same one that could be your saviour tonight that says, come, we'll bid you depart. Depart from me. I never knew you. And every one of us shall give account of himself to God. Now look to yourself tonight. Are you his? Because you see tonight, if you're his, you'll never face the judgment. Go to be his tonight, before he comes. He promised to come again for his own in the, the upper room. He says, I will come again. The Lord is coming for those that are his own. And then the Lord is coming to judge this world. And he'll judge it in righteousness. Oh, not like the old judgments that happen today. And even the best of men handing down the best of judgments with the decisions they've got to make, there'll be no miscarriages in that day. No, God will judge righteously. Nothing will be gainsaid. Where will you stand? Where do you stand? What do you need to do to be right with God? Repent from your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus. And now shall be saved. So many things tonight. Lovely things that we've thought about that are his. Would you be his? It would be good tonight if you could say that you belong to Christ. Now shall we pray and ask God's blessing?